We have to add some more definitions here. And these, some of these I've already talked to, but when we talk about the pelagic zone or pelagic waters, and pelagic waters could be anything from the very surface to the deepest depths out of really the influence of the seafloor, the pelagic zone is subject to the motions and conditions of the water column. The benthic zone, we already talked about being on the bottom. The neuritic or coastal zone, influenced by terrestrial processes, or the oceanic or open ocean zone beyond the influence of terrestrial processes. These are important definitions because we talk about these when we talk about organisms and where they live. And even if you watch a series like Blue Planet or something on the Discovery Channel about marine life, they'll use these words pelagic or open ocean or benthic. Let's talk a little bit more detail about the photic zone or what we call the epipelagic zone. This is really where there's a lot of action in the ocean. The epipelagic zone is subject to atmospheric processes. There's exchange of gases. There's exchange of energy from sunlight. There's exchange of energy from winds, uh, which impart kinetic energy and momentum to the surface of the ocean. We have waves. We have currents. We have vertical mixing. There's really a lot going on in the epipelagic zone, as noted here. Tides and eddies and all these different kinds of things. This zone is highly variable, highly dynamic over both spatial scales and temporal scales, and it's just the energy zone, but that's where we find so many of the organisms that we're familiar with, the whales and dolphins and fish, and really that's where we play when we go into the ocean or if we go out on a boat and do any sort of uh, recreational fishing or anything like that. We're in the epipelagic zone. We're really interacting with that epipelagic zone. The lower limit of this zone is generally set at about the 1% light level. That means where the light intensity at a particular depth is 1% of the surface intensity. So where light diminishes down from 100% of the surface to about 1%, we call that the bottom or the lower limit of the epipelagic zone. That's also known as a euphotic zone, and that's the region in which photosynthesis occurs. Okay, so we're partitioning the photic zone a little bit, the photic zone being defined as the deepest depth of light penetration, and we also define the 1% light level as that region in which photosynthesis may occur. Two different kinds of subtle definitions, but important ones um, nonetheless. And as I say here, most of what oceanographers know, and most of what students know, and most of what we've ever experienced is with the epipelagic zone. This is what it looks like if you're underwater looking up from the seafloor or from a, in a coral reef in clear waters. Here you see sunlight penetrating down. This is the epipelagic zone. The mesopelagic zone, or what's also called the twilight zone, really kind of captures our interest because it's in this zone that we begin to encounter some of the stranger animals uh, that, that exist in the world ocean. This zone generally extends from the bottom of the euphotic zone, so from that 1% light level to about a thousand meters in depth. And again, it really just depends on the particular location and the time of year and all those kinds of things. But the mesopelagic zone or the um, twilight zone represents a boundary between surface processes and things that are completely completely in the realm of the dark. So it's a transition between surface processes and deeper process. There's a lot going in it. Really, uh, the mesopelagic zone, it receives everything that comes filtering down from the epipelagic zone. So there's a lot of activity here as well, though it's not as uh, dynamic, of course, as the epipelagic zone. Some of the characteristics of this particular habitat, it's dimly lit, of course. You can barely see. It's just sort of like uh, um, that very, it's sort of like walking around at night in a place that's uh, not quite completely dark, but pretty dark. It's variable in temperature. It may um, be subject to some deep uh, mixing at particular times of years. It's probably less chemically variable than the surface waters. Um, it's certainly biologically, biologically rich, and that biology is dependent on surface productivity. A couple things that we talked about earlier in the semester, the oxygen minimum zone, which we talked just briefly about 
in chapter four, I believe it was, or chapter, excuse me, chapter six, when we talked about ocean chemistry, and something called the deep scattering layer, which we haven't talked about, but the deep scattering layer is a layer that scatters sound, and it was an important layer recognized when we started looking for submarines using echo sounders and those kind of things. I suggest you look it up if you're interested in that kind of thing. But this is where, this zone is where the oxygen minimum zone and the deep scattering layer occur. It's also here where organisms kind of hide out. Now, one of the things that most people aren't aware of is one of the largest migrations of animals on our planet. It's not the blue whales, it's not the birds flying from one place to another. It has much more fascinating characters than even that movie, Winged Migration, which was a good movie, but that was all about birds. In the ocean, the largest migration of animals on our planet occurs every night as organisms ascend up at night and move back down in a, in, to deeper depths at the beginning of day, at dawn. So at dusk, when the lights go out, these organisms move up. The largest migration of all, and we talked about that in Chapter 12. We're really just beginning to explore the zone, and the availability of remotely operated vehicles and submersibles are really giving us some uh, an opportunity to explore the zone. The Monterey Bay Aquarium has been really uh, a forerunner in exploring the um, twilight zone around Monterey Bay Canyon, Monterey Bay Submarine Canyon, and it seems like every time they go out they see some creature they've never seen before. So there's, again, like most of the ocean, a lot to be learned, a lot that's unexplored, and a lot of interesting things happening in this particular zone. Here's just a picture from NOAA of what are called lantern fishes. And they're called lantern fishes, well, because they light up. And these actually mesopelagic dwelling lantern fishes make up about 90% of the biomass of all the deep sea fishes. So here we have in the mesopelagic or twilight zone, a particular kind of fish, lantern fish, that are really abundant and compared to all the fish that we find in the deep sea. That would be from the bottom of the epipelagic zone deeper. So this is where we find most of the different kinds of fish. Lantern fish. Here's a short up nose green eye fish. And in this case this was actually the these colors were produced by shining light on this fish, but it actually is something called fluorescence and we're not sure why these particular fish fluoresce or why that would be important for a fish but if you put it under the lights of a submersible and use a filter that only lets green light through this is what this particular fish looks like again just some weird strange thing that we don't know why don't know what it's doing but we observe it and nonetheless here's another bizarre mesopelagic organism this one was found in the midwaters off Monterey Bay, Tiburonia Gran Rojo, because it's big and it has this little reddish tinge to it, and it's some kind of bizarre jellyfish. Who knew?